guess. Deep space gleams with a light from distant stars. Suddenly, a big dark hunk of metal passes by with steady speed, like a blue whale in a black ocean. The dim light of a sunless galaxy illuminates the protrusions of this bronze structure. It is the ETEC cargo extraction vessel, headed for an obscured planet in the distance. As the ship enters the atmosphere of XN-13, thick cloud cover flows over the metal, like crisp white sheets, for there is no oxygen or nitrogen on this planet. As the crew travel over the surface of this darkly veiled planet, light emanating from nearby stars reveals rocky mountain outcrops, seen as a bluish tint, exposing the edges and tips of the jagged terrain. The large, elongated slab of abstract-shaped bronze metal lands in the center of a mining depot settlement, its landing thrusters kicking up dust. The airlock hatch opens with vapor escaping into the airless atmosphere, as the extraction crew disembark down the ramp, men on either side flank what looks like a floating coffin, covered with little lights. On either side of the astronauts, we see the living quarters structures, shaped like pods, mounted on frames for support, with spotlights in between, illuminating a man walking down the stairs of the planet's base, it's Captain Komatsu. Morning gentlemen, the flight was not too long I hope. He says, joking sardonically. Ship Captain Rames responds. Cryosleep made the trip shorter, the high quantity of argon and hydrogen makes for some air pressure, at least. Base Captain Komatsu adds. Yes, that's why we should not remove our helmets, and make sure you do not let the brittle rock substrate scratch that casket, causing any spark. Rame says. We are just picking up the crystal energy and then leaving again, and we are always careful. Komatsu retorts. What, no alcoholic beverage, first. Rames responds. No thanks, remember to refuel your generator and resupply your oxygen chambers from the base. Komatsu replies. Yes, thanks, the supply ship is delayed. The extraction team then proceed to their destination, a cave, where deep inside the crystal energy is mined. It is ready for transport, artificial light fades into the darkness of the rocky cavity. Twenty minutes later, lights slowly reappear, as the team emerge out of the dark, the light within their helmets illuminate serious blue glowing faces, with crew on either side guiding the extraction cargo casket. The rare crystal, now sealed and secured by ETEC, is a valuable product when melted down, providing Earth with a high potential energy resource. Captain Komatsu waves goodbye to the crew as they enter the hatch of Orion. 
the bay door slowly shuts with a hydraulic hum and hissing air pressure as the thrusters engage once again. Dust is kicked up as before, as they're seen slowly returning to the snowy white clouds. Chapter 1. One month later. Aboard the Uriel 1, we find a group of reconnaissance members and employees of ETEC, otherwise known as the Extraterrestrial Energy Corporation. One of them is the vessel's captain, Novak Kruger, who has woken from his cryo chamber that kept eight crew members intact while the ship was in hyperdrive. Novak inquires, how is it going here on flight deck? He asks his pilot and longtime teammate, Anton Goodman, who responds. Well, I just woke up from 20 days of sleep, but if my bearings are correct, we should be reaching the recon point in about an hour, it sure is dark in this part of the universe. Novak states, according to the mining scientists on XN13, the crystal energy source can only stay stable in darkness. Anton pushes some buttons and pulls a chrome lever to open the screen, a protective metal shield covering the observation window. It slowly descends, displaying a view of the universe littered with stars. Novak heads down to the engine room to see if everything is running smoothly. Engineer, Heinz Jurgen, is already busy welding components for a scanning rig. Novak speaks. Hey, Heinz. Sleep well did you? Eager to upgrade the scanner, hey. We can't take any chances with a substance we know absolutely squat about. Heinz responds. Yes sir, she's my baby. I missed her. I added a beam enhancer to scan wider and further, keeping us in safe distance from any surprises. Novak concludes. Good thinking, we'll be at the checkpoint in an hour. The captain promptly leaves the engine room to check on the rest of the crew. Back on Earth in an ETEC conference room, a heated discussion ensues regarding the events unfolding. The CEO is seriously concerned about proceedings, while the general of the reconnaissance operation attempts to assure him that the cargo will be salvaged and Earth, or better yet, ETEC, will have its energy resource recovered. Back on the salvage ship Uriel 1, Captain Kruger is in the mess hall with the rest of ETEC's employees, sharing a meal to replenish the nutrition lost while in cryostasis. Jenna Aldridge, a scientist aboard the ship, is also seated at the table, eating, while commenting on the mission so far, saying. Even while everything is preserved and stagnant inside our bodies while in cryo, you still feel ravenous and sorely dehydrated when it's over. Heinz comments. I feel like a melted popsicle when it's over. Shinobu Tanaka chips in, saying, cool. The crew fills the entire hall with laughter. <laughs> Vessel technician, Shinobu, deals with all the electronics on the ship. He is also highly acquainted with every ETEC vessel, from air pressure hatches to flight control panels, including AI mainframes. The sixth member at the table is Denver Matolo, from Kenya, who lives in India where ETEC's labs are situated. He is the utility expert for the appropriate salvage gear for each mission, partly because of the fact that he is an ex-special ops recruit. Member number 7, Koreshni Japta, holds the position of Operation Communication and Navigation Officer. She's busy sipping on a glass of red wine to calm her nerves, as she suffers from post-cryotension. Red wine helps her relax, she's known to say. Seated alongside her is Kumi Matsuzaki, the electrical engineer, who's adept with cargo vessels like the one on their checkpoint list. 
She is the eighth and final team member on this 45,000-ton recon and salvage ship, consisting of five levels, six sectors and a docking bay. The cargo vessel hovering in space is similar, with the same docking bay for interlocking safe passage, transporting cargo from the one to the other. As they eat and laugh, they presume this to be just another salvage mission, in the hope that the crew of the ETC cargo ship, or Ion, are alive and well, and that they haven't had any casualties yet. This is their twelfth mission together, and have become close friends, some more so than others. Everyone finishes up their meals. Shinobu pipes up, hey, Heinz, it's your turn to wash the dishes. Heinz retorts with, yeah, yeah, I'm yeah, finishing yeah, my, I'm beer finish first. my beer first. No back ads. No drinking and welding hay. Heinz replies. No captain, I am finished for today. Novak heads down a burnt orange colored corridor to Jenna's quarters, as black rib pipes like giant caterpillars crawl along the ceiling, of which are used to transport the ship's precious oxygen to all sectors of the ship. There are fluorescent lights on the sides and under glass floors that light the passageways, now casting a shadow of Novak onto the entrance of Jenna's room door. The door splits apart in two sections with the push of the button, alerting Jenna. She consents to the visitor, opening the black reflective one-way glass privacy screen. Novak speaks. Hi darling, eat well. I see you're feeling more refreshed. Jenna replies with. Oh, thanks for the compliment. Nice to see you too. You ready to investigate this elusive ghost ship corporate is so worried about? Novak adds. Well, it's Earth's last hope for the energy problem. Looks like our world is headed for the Neo Dark Ages. And all our technology and machinery will mean nothing if we don't collect that crystal. Jenna responds. Don't you care about the people on that ship, if they're even alive or perhaps suffering? They haven't had communication with Earth for over a month now. Novak goes on to say. Yes Jenna, I feel for them, but we've been through this before. No one died and the materials were shipped back to Earth, the vessels were towed back, and all was not lost, be more positive about this mission we are on now. This is the big one and possibly the last one, the big payoff then we can retire to that house by the beach. Jenna only smiles while brushing her hair, gazing into the mirror. Novak proceeds to walk over to her kissing her on the neck. The crew are now 33 minutes from the destination checkpoint. We find Shinobu in the control room, located at the top of the ship, above the engine room. The mainframe computer regulates and maintains the machinery in the engine room, and is linked to the artificial intelligence of the mainframe. Her name is AIMI, or Artificially Intelligent Mainframe Interactive. Shinobu talks to her like just another love interest, apart from his affection for Kumi of course. AIMI's conversation with Shinobu is heard. Yes, technician, I have reanalyzed all vessel data, in conclusion, all systems are at optimal performance, the docking bay is on standby, Yuri-1 is reducing speed, checkpoint radar is locked onto point of interest. Shinobu enters in the final codes and strokes the console, as if to convey his affection for AIMI, his prized possession. But, technically, she remains the property of the company. Back on the flight deck, Anton is controlling the steering levers, lining up Uriel 1's trajectory with the mysterious Orion, who holds the all-too-precious cargo on board. Novak is at the flight deck observation window, his hand resting on Anton's shoulder, looking on intently at their approach. Anton proceeds to smoothly glide them alongside the bronze juggernaut. Anton voices his concerns. In the event of approaching this vessel, are you worried for our safety, especially Jenna's? Cause, I mean, you two are close. Novak replies. Thanks for your interest, but some things are best left private, yes, my faith can be tested, all within reason. But we need to remember, not all things are in God's hands, as we know, we've got to beware the dark side of life. If you believe in such things. Anton responds. Personally, I'm agnostic, but yes, shit does happen. And it's our God-given choice, if you will, to have faith. But, to clarify, I believe more in reason. Novak adds. Where is the line between, the spiritual, science, and reality? Why is the earth and everything on it so perfect and yet the universe so endless? Humans are biological beings, perfectly adapted to the earth, with emotions and intelligence, yet we are so fragile because of it. Anton retorts. Sir, snap out of it, you are drifting too deep. I'm only a pilot, not a priest or philosopher. Novak goes on to say. Sorry, Sorry Anton, Anton, emotions, emotions I, tell I tell you. I don't go to church very often, but my heart holds something I can't explain. Anton comments. Like your love for Jenna. Novak agrees, saying, that, that too. too. The 
Imperial One glides through a space in the universe, its lights glowing all over, like fireflies hitching a ride on some kind of nocturnal elephant, and in the distance, a faint silhouette and a dim flicker of what appears to be a dormant vessel, is visible. No back checks on the crew before they embark on the next step of the mission, and finds Denver in the utility bay. Denver says. Captain Kruger what brings you here? I'm just checking our suits and flamethrowers for optimal functionality. Novak comments. Hi Denver, yes, Anton is concerned for the safety of our search team, you included. Denver states. It's all good sir. Novak replies. We might have to wear our suits the entire time, remember 2039, planet KN010. We were under the impression the planet contained oxygen. Heinz removed his helmet before Jenna could calibrate the air content, and he almost choked to death on xenon exposure. Luckily, all the mining settlers were evacuated early enough after the generator malfunction. Denver adds. That's why I suggested to the company we use early warning systems on base camps. Novak responds. Good thinking, that's why you are the most important person on our team, so flamethrowers hey. Denver, chips in. I thought it would come in handy for testing the air purity levels, as well as providing some protection, we really don't know much about this substance. Novak goes on to say. It's only a crystal, but well done, I don't like being empty-handed myself. Denver Matolo smiles and returns to his work. The team are now 22 miles from the salvage point at a speed of 185 miles per hour. The ship reduces velocity one last time to a safe crawl. AIMI informs the crew of the proceedings. Attention crew, we are now in range of our destination, reducing speed, please stand by. Pareshni prefers using telecoms to speak to her family, who are now on screen, they miss their mom. A slight sparkle of tears forms on her eyelids, as she longs for them. The picture shudders out of focus every so often, as her children return her smile. Her husband waves goodbye, while she tells him she has to go attend to her duties. Koreshni waves back and her husband blows her a farewell kiss, the picture distorts one last time, fading to black. AIMI suddenly comes online, saying. Comms are online, navigation is engaged, ready to approach vessel in T-minus 10 minutes, report to the hangar, and suit up for the mission. AIMI's digitized voice echoes down the flight deck control room, while Anton and Novak's attention are firmly fixed out the observation window, analyzing the Orion vessel, cloaked in darkness, with only a few dim lights still burning. Orbiting only a few miles from XN-13, the crew attempt to board. Captain Kruger instructs the pilot. Anton, hold her steady, I'll round up everyone and head for the hangar, we should first see if we can attempt communication with the captain on board, and find out why they are orbiting with almost zero backup generator power. Anton responds. Sure thing, boss I'll also remain here to monitor your position. Keep in touch so we can let each other know how the situation develops. Novak states. God help us, it just doesn't feel right, not like the other missions. Anton pulls a face of uncertainty as he peers out the window, a control panel's light flickers red, accentuating his facial features. Novak turns and walks. Shinobu and Kumi enter the hangar, and lift their suits off chrome hangars, which are held in glass preservation chambers. Shinobu says. You always look so hot in those tight shorts before you don your suit, and then all I see is your face obscured in a helmet for the whole mission. Kumi replies, play your cards, play your cards and wrong, wrong and that's all you will ever see. Shinobu smiles and hooks the safety catches on the front of his outfit. Captain Kruger arrives, strutting in with the rest of the team. Novak addresses the crew. Before we embark on this mission, can we please gather our thoughts? I am aware some of you don't believe in the same god as I do, but we do have some faith between us. And like every mission that has gone before, we pray, we pray for our souls, so that the angels may watch over us, and no evil or misfortune shall befall us, we shall be successful by the helping hand of God, thank you Lord, Amen. Everyone's eyes open as they all nod, approvingly. All their faces are serious and ready. The rest of the crew turn to retrieve their suits. Denver hands the captain a flamethrower, blue light reflects off the metallic weapon. Novak remarks. She's a beauty. One other thing, did you get a chance to speak to your wife? When we get this crystal back to Earth, she must first run a diagnostic test with a new heat signature relay, via the satellite ports. I really don't like boarding a vessel with a substance I know absolutely zero about, and I honestly don't think the company is up to speed, either. Denver responds. Basha has already placed the device in cold storage to preserve its effectiveness. Novak smiles and shakes Denver's hand. 
Novak ends, saying. Let's be careful on that ship, this mission is starting to smell. The vessel is some 200 yards away, as Uriel 1 makes one last turn, all the while the metal of the ship creaks and groans. The thrusters are turned off completely, with them now slowly drifting towards the docking bay of Orion. Uriel 1 features a docking bay at the bottom where Orion's is at the top, although both are positioned in the center of the ships. As they gracefully interlink, the form of a gigantic metal cross begins to emerge, seemingly hanging in space, with the dark planet forming the backdrop. Captain is the last to secure his helmet in place, as fat burnt copper toned gloved fingers secure a helmet of the same hue into place, the visor now obscuring his face, making it barely visible. He then switches the inner helmet lights on, via a button on the chin panel, lighting up his face in blue, reflected from the little lights paneled on either side of his helmet's jaw cushions. Shinobu pulls a lever down, while Kumi does the same on the other side of the hatch. Both then proceed to penetrate all five glove fingers into five corresponding metal orifices, positioned around the top of a glass dome. It glows red, signaling them to carry out the procedure simultaneously in their respective sockets. The hatch instantly releases its outer rings, and cracks open with a deafening hiss, vapor hurriedly escaping from the edges. All seven enter the umbilical passage between the ships, heading towards Orion's hatch, their metal space boots thudding loudly with every step. The hatch of Uriel 1 automatically closes behind Koreshni, Shinobu and Kumi. This time, to gain entry, they override the outer panel module for Orion's hatch with portable digital hacking devices. A click is heard behind the hatch, and then it releases with an ear-piercing serpentine-like hiss, slowly revealing a shattered room. Koreshni is the last to enter the vessel's dark void. The two Japanese technicians proceed to close the hatch, sealing the crew inside the ship's eerily silent gloom. 